and there's a lot of different angles that questions would come from, um, I thought, from this. So I don't think it's realistic to try and cover kind of everything in the chapter. So I will get you guys to read it in detail um, if you get a chance. Um, what I wanted to cover is the consensus statement on diagnosis and treatment of IMHA because it gives us an opportunity to look at the different types of anemia, what the differentials would be and what to look out for to be able to say it's definitely IMHA or I need to do further testing. Is that all right with everybody? Yes. Perfect. I've read it a couple of times, but of course it doesn't stay inside very long at this stage. <laughs> No, and it's a, I sort of put a few pickies and stuff in like, you know, what, what a spherocyte looks like and stuff like that. So hopefully it'll be helpful. Um, I'll just get Dan in, Danielle, if you're there, can you please enable uh, screen sharing for me? No, so Danielle is the moderator, is she? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was wondering who that was. Yeah. Here we go. We're away. Okay. Okay, so can everyone see it? Yep. yep. Awesome. Yep. Okay, we're gonna start with just a couple of blood tests just to talk about the different parameters we're looking at on our um, on the initial, I guess most most dogs come in, pearl gums, pyrexia. You run a CBC and this is the first thing you're going to be looking at to make a judgment on what's going on or what's the cause of the anemia in, in these patients. Um, so can somebody please tell me what they think of this CBC profile? Yeah. <clears throat> One of the, the interesting things there is that our pathologist, his name just escapes me, it's CSU, mm -hmm. saying that the MCHC really can't be above normal. Mm. So I'm wondering whether that's an artifact uh, for that to have happened there or not. It's a, a it's really hemolysis or something like that. If you get hemolysis in, this, in the blood, it, you can get a high MCHC. I vaguely remember that from uni. But. Yeah, absolutely. So hemolysis is one cause, but also just delay between um, sampling and processing. As the cells get dehydrated, the fluid component inside the cells decreases. So there's more hemoglobin per volume kind of thing in the cell because the fluids escaped. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but the, to, I guess to interpret the CBC mm -hmm. um, and to describe the anemia, you'd probably have to say it's a, either a pre-regenerative or non-regenerative mm -hmm. hypochromic microcytic anemia. Um, what, did you say hyperchromic? Yes. Yep. So technically true, but we know that hyperchromic really doesn't mean anything. So I usually call these guys normochromic. No, oh, okay. Yeah. So um, you can sort of, it's kind of reassuring to know that there's not low hemoglobin, but um, so you can kind of take the iron deficiency anemias and blood loss anemias off the list of this. So we've got a non-regenerative microcytic anemia with no hypochromia. And I just said something wrong. So um, you forget what I said about iron. <laughs> what are the differentials for this? So say this, this patient has a three week history of lethargy. Are we, can we confidently say it's non-regenerative or do we still have to have pre-regenerative on the list? No, not really. Yeah. If he's sick for three weeks. Yeah, I agree. So how long should a patient be sick for before we can say it's confident, confidently it's non-regenerative? Uh, five days. Yeah, good. Excellent. Okay, so what are the differentials for this type of anemia? Iron deficiency okay. anemia. Mm-hmm. Um, and like a, just your like general chronic anemias, um, mm -hmm. things like gastrointestinal bleeding, um, I guess chronic hemolysis, chronic hemorrhage. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the probably important thing is external hemorrhage because internal hemorrhage, they just reabsorb it and reuse it. So they, they don't get that um, change in cell size. Would that be like urinary tract hemorrhage as well, like chronic urinary tract hemorrhage? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So gastrointestinal and urinary tract are the classic ones for sure. Um, there's a toxicity that can cause this type of anemia as well. Does anyone know what it is? Onion? Oh, yeah, onions and... Um, that's a good thought, but I would expect in that sort of anemia to be regenerative. Oh, okay. And I probably would expect the cell lead. size to be normal too. Is it lead? Yeah, it is actually. Chronic lead. Yeah, chronic low-grade lead. So obviously higher levels of lead will cause neurological gastrointestinal signs. But low level of lead toxicity <laughs> over a chronic period will cause a mild anemia like this. If we sent this off to a lab and had them look at the red cells, what would we expect to see if there was lead toxicity? Nosophilic stippling. But you don't always get it though. Good, excellent. What was that? Sorry, I missed that. Nosophilic stippling. Cool, okay. So that's a, if you're, if you've kind of quizzed an owner and there's a history of potential lead exposure, I would write on my request form for a smear review concern over lead toxicity and get them to comment on that specifically. Um, the other thing that I actually learnt as a cause of this type of anemia um, was vitamin B6 um, deficiency, which I've never diagnosed or hasn't really been on my radar, but it's an interesting thing to look out for. So moving away from the chronic sort of blood loss, there's another cause of microcytic, normochromic, uh, non-regenerative anemias. Um, typically see it in young dogs. Comes with a, other clinical signs usually, but I don't want to give it away. Like the GI sign, like diarrhea? It might have diarrhea. Is it one? Well, like like a like a worm burden. I'd probably call that a chronic. Put that in the classification of chronic blood loss, even though the blood doesn't necessarily come out; it goes into the worms. But um, it's a an an extra gas, gastrointestinal disease, which can cause gastrointestinal blood loss. Yes. 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 Good, Alex. That was excellent. Sorry, I didn't hear that. What was that? A shunt. A shunt. Wow. Oh, okay. So classic CVC in dogs with shunts is a microcytic normochromic anemia. So it's always on my radar to then go back and quiz people about behaviour changes and, and things like that for dogs with a microcytic normochromic anemia, particularly young dogs who are otherwise well. Um, and the only other thing that we're not, we don't have the platelet count on this sort of section, um, but with iron deficiency anemia, they often have a thrombocytosis, which I didn't know, but I think is very interesting, sort of another thing to point towards chronic external blood loss. Okay, so we're gonna move on to next CVC. Who wants to classify this one for me? Like a normal chromic, uh, normal cytic anemia. I don't know if it's uh, regenerative yet. Mm -hmm. Pre or non regenerative. Non regenerative. So, this is a dog with chronic gastrointestinal signs over the course of a year waxing and waning. Four year old. So that's exactly how I'd classify it. So normocytic, normochromic, and non-regenerative anemias. What are your differentials? Well, anemia of chronic mm. disease, I guess, would be yeah. <laughs> a, a broad sure. sweeping statement. Uh, and that's, that's exactly it. So what sort of scale of anemia would you expect with anemia of chronic disease? Would it be? Would it ever be severe? Would you ever see the PCV below fifteen? 
I would think not. Good. Excellent. So a mild to moderate, normocytic, normal chromic anemia. We're thinking chronic, chronic anemia, chronic disease. Can you kind of, have you got a kind of system to think about that with? So you're dividing up chronic diseases into what sort of further testing you need to do? Bone, bone marrow aspirates, that kind of thing? Yes. So I sort of divide up my chronic diseases into inflammatory diseases. So have they got evidence of a long, long-standing infection? Have they got diffuse lymphadenomegaly? So inflammatory disease, endocrine disease. So we've got a four-year-old dog with waxing, waning gastrointestinal signs over four years. What's on your differential list? Addison's. Very good. Yeah, as a cause of this type of anemia, absolutely. Um, okay, now we've got an eight-year-old dog who's gained weight over the last year and has symmetrical flank alopecia. Hypothyroidism. Excellent. So exactly the same type of anemia. So I've got chronic inflammatory disease and then I've got endocrine disease and they're the main two, endocrine disease. And then I've got renal disease, which is obviously going to show up on the rest of your blood work. So it's not going to be a big mystery. Um, so they're the three for mild to moderate. But then the other things I want to check when I've got this type of anemia, like you said, Josh, is for bone marrow disease. So are there any other cell lines affected? Which cell line is first affected? So if there's a um, tox toxicity that affects the bone marrow, which cell line will go down first? It would have been neutrophils. Excellent. Yeah. And then? Thrombocytes. No. Nope. Lymphocytes? <laughs> nope. Monocytes? Nope. Eosinophils? <laughs> <laughs> red blood cells. Sorry. <laughs> I'm obviously thinking in the white blood cell venous. Red blood cells next. So neutrophils go oh. down first. Oh, sorry. I thought we were, red blood cells were first and then neutrophils. Okay. No, actually neutrophils first and then red blood cells. Gotcha. Sorry. So, the nice thing about that is if you've got an anemia, if it's bone marrow disease, you're almost certainly going to have a neutropenia as well because they'll go down first. So neutrophils first, then red cells, then platelets. That's the order. So bone marrow disease, you quite often get an anemia or a neutropenia with normal platelet count, um, just because that's the sort of the pro progression. And is that why when we're treating polycythemia, we have to watch some neutrophils to make sure that they don't become too low when you're trying to make the red blood cells less? Okay. Absolutely. So we're decreasing bone marrow activity and in doing that, we're going to decrease both the red cell number and the neutrophil number. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, so if there was a neutropenia, I would look at doing bone marrow aspirates and, um, or biopsies. Do my boobs. Pardon? What do you do with my boobs? Oh. Okay, next one. Um, so regenerate, mildly regen regenerative, um, normocytic, uh, hypochromic anemia. Good. Excellent. So what does the hypochromic tell you in this context? There's probably a lot of reticular signs. Yeah, totally. So same amount of hemoglobin in a bigger volume of cell. So it reads low. Um, and what do you think of this reticular site count? You sort of said moderately regenerative. It's yeah, not it's a bit, uh, it could be early, um, mm -hmm. an early regenerative response or a weekly regenerative response, I would say at this point. Mm -hmm. Good, excellent. Um, so that brings us to regenerative anemias. And this blood test is actually Blaze's first blood test that we did, that was in an IMHA dog that was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago. Um, so back. Hey. He's back. <laughs> is he relapsed? No, he's in the hospital at the moment for lameness. So maybe oh. clot, something. I'm not sure. Oh no. Oh, lucky we talk so much about clots to them. <laughs> <laughs> I was just um we uh this is a border collie who has IMHA and um the last border collie I had who had IMHA had a massive PTE and died. 
and I just caught myself talking to these owners being very pessimistic about the risk of clots and, and things because in my mind, border collies die of clots with, when they've got IMHA, which is just it's not true at all. But, you know, you create these biases based on your experiences. Mm. So it was a good, good sort of um, note for me to be a little bit more aware of um, my previous experiences impacting my prognosis. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're moving on to talk specifically about IMHA and in doing that, we'll talk a little bit about other causes of hemolysis as well. Um, hemolytic anemias of any kind, whether they're immune mediated or not, should be regenerative after five days. If they're not, then we need to consider a bone marrow component to that disease because of the stimulation to the bone marrow should be not strong. Um, so when we talk about IMHA, we commonly talk about things that can trigger an autoimmune hemolysis and we divide up IMHA into primary, which means just there's not no sort of environmental trigger for that immune derangement or secondary where there is a trigger for that um, the, or the immune system targeting the red cells. So what, what are some of the triggers for IMHA that we know of in dogs and cats? Uh, vaccination. B pardon, Helen? Vaccination, potentially. Potentially, yep, yeah, it's been poo pooed, but it's definitely been on the list of discussion and we always ask people what their vaccination history is and how recently they've had a vaccination. So did a study, particularly in dogs with IMT, um, looking at where the dogs were more likely to have had a vaccination in the four weeks preceding onset of IMT, and they actually weren't. And they put that association down to the fact that dogs get a, a vaccination every 12 months. So one in 12 dogs theoretically will have had a vaccination within that the month preceding IMT development. So they actually don't have evidence that vaccination triggers it at this point. And that's true for IMHA as well. Um, anything else? Infection. Good. UTI. What sort of infection? UTI. B pattern? Like a UTI. Yes, good. Antibiotics, like a moxiclav. Good. Lymphoma. Neoplasia. Neoplasia, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I want to go back to infection and we, let's think specifically about cats. What would trigger their immune system to target their red cells? Mycoplasma. Absolutely. So that's a really appropriate hemolysis or immune activity, but it's damaging nonetheless. Any other red cell um, organisms that might trigger IMHA? Babesiosis. Good. Leukia? Uh, I don't think it's here, but it's yeah. in, in Europe they have it. That's, and there's actually been two cases recently in Sydney. So, um, oh, interesting. Helen, Helen Paris diagnosed. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, so, absolutely. Yeah. In the Northern Territory and, um, and I think Northern Western Australia. Yes, they're diagnosing more and more, actually. They didn't sort of realise how endemic it was in the um, kind of community dog population. And now that everyone in Sydney is after puppies and people are importing puppies from Northern Territory, the, these cases are being reported. There's one on the South Coast and two in Sydney in the last couple of months. Um, it's a, a lick is a reportable disease. So if you are suspicious of it, um, definitely report it to... Um, the e, mm, EMAI, Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute. They've got a, and the D, Department of Primary Industries. They've, they'll do free testing for you. Okay, I'm moving on to the answers. So the causes of IMHA or triggers for IMHA, infections, including cystitis and pneumonia. Um, different antibiotics have been implicated and actually... In horses, they've been definitely documented to trigger IMHA and certainly in humans, but we actually don't have good kind of evidence-based medicine 
evidence for antibiotics triggering IMHA in dogs and cats. So I guess that's kind of, we should be wary of it. Theoretically, it's possible, but we don't know that. Um, neoplasia for sure, but cats are more likely to get IMHA associated with neoplasia than dogs are. Um, there's a couple of single case reports where pancreatitis has been associated with the development of IMHA, but whether it was cause or effect, we're not sure. And certainly where there's one autoimmune disease, such as immune-mediated polyarthropathy or thrombocytopenia, we know then that they're more prone to getting IMHA. So we put other autoimmune diseases on the list of, of triggers of IMHA. And then I put vaccinations here with a question mark because theoretically the degree of immune stimulation just creates an opportunity for the immune system to mount an inappropriate reaction. Um, but at this point, we don't have any real evidence to say that that happens in dogs and cats. So if you're presented with a patient who's a four-year-old female Spay Maltese, and they've presented to you with pale gums and um, a pyrexia and have been off their food for a couple of days. That I'm going to say five days. I've just got a list here of the, you know, obviously we're looking at an, an anemia in this patient. I've just got a list here of the things that kind of make it stand out as an autoimmune hemolytic anemia as opposed to another cause of anemia other than the CBC findings. Um, hemolytic serum. Has anybody ever seen an IMHA dog with red serum? Yep. Yep. Picture. Do you know what that means? More intravascular hemolysis than extravascular. Very good. Does everybody know what intravascular hemolysis versus extravascular hemolysis means? More aggressive treatment. Absolutely, yeah. So it tends to be more aggressive disease, but as far as what's mediating the hemolysis from a etiopathogenesis sort of approach. Is it just that the white cells are chomping and targeting the red blood cells in the bloodstream rather than being taken out by the spleen and, and tissues to break it down? It's actually um, intravascular hemolysis is complement mediated. Do you remember those MAC complexes that just punch holes in cells? Like opsonization? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So complement acts as an opsonizer, which literally means make tasty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it can also combine to form this MAC attack complex that binds to cells and punches holes in them and causes lysis. So where macrophage mediated IMHA takes a chomp out of the cell membrane and the cell membrane closes over again to form a spherocyte or it gets phagocytosed and dies. So you don't actually get release of the hemoglobin into circulation with extravascular hemolysis, which happens in the spleen and it's macrophage mediated. Whereas in the circulation and it's complement mediating it, they just punch a hole in the cell and all the hemoglobin comes out. So with intravascular hemolysis, you get hemolytic serum. And that's a big red flag for me prognostically and kind of the, how aggressive I am about treatment um, if we've got hemolytic serum. As opposed to icteric serum, which would suggest, again, hemolysis, um, as long as there's no concurrent liver problems that might be causing the hemolysis. Um, but it does indicate extravascular. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Good. And then I think everybody's <clears throat> seen autoagglutination. So if you do your CBC and you tip the EDTA tube and have a look at it, if there's clumps in there, you can almost certainly say, okay, it's time out, Or you can go down that pathway even before you run your CBC. So um, that, that's effectively a positive Coombs test, isn't it? It is, exactly. Yeah. And we'll talk about this um, consensus statement has kind of really straightforward guidelines to making a diagnosis and, and you essentially either need a positive saline agglutination or a positive Coombs. And we generally don't run a Coombs if there's a very strong positive saline agglutination. 
But um, Coombs tests only positive in about two thirds of cases, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So we get a lot of false negatives and false positives with Coombs. And that's why we rely on saline agglutination as well as that. And then if we don't get a positive on either of those, there are other ways of diagnosing IMHA, but you've got to do more tests. Um, so if you happen to be doing an ultrasound in this patient, so say it's come in anemic, you want to rule out, or pre-regenerative anemia, you want to rule out um, bleeding. Um, ultrasound findings that we commonly see, particularly with extravascular hemolysis, are splenomegaly or hypercoic spleen. And interestingly, we see the blood flow in the hepatic veins and, and caudal vena cava is really echogenic when normally it's not. Um, and there are other causes of that, but it's one of the things that does make me think, okay, this, there's aggregates in circulation because it's causing more echo. Um, we commonly see a pyrexia. Obviously, we see PCV falling, and sometimes these dogs come in when they're pyrexic but not anemic yet. Um, and a trap that particularly we saw with Blaze, who was acting more anemic than he was, when there's bigger glutenates in circulation, those red blood cells can't participate very well in oxygen exchange. So the actual oxygen delivery to the tissue is much lower than the PCV represents. So PCV just stacks down all those aggregates together and the PCV doesn't look that bad early on, but the actual oxygen delivery to tissues can be worse. Um, regeneration, we always think hemolysis should be regenerative, but 30% of dogs are non-regenerative at presentation. So they present, or they often become anemic very early in the course of disease. So within that first five days, and it's not, don't rule it out if they're non-regenerative, we'll call it pre-regenerative. And then there's also those dogs that have bone marrow directed IMHA and they'll never be regenerative. And then obviously if you're looking at a smear in-house before you've sent out your test, so if you run your CBC in-house, you should look at a smear and seeing spherocytes is very telling for um, extravascular hemolysis in particular. But I will just say that you want to analyze for spherocytes before the transfusion because um, transfused cells will um, are more likely to turn into spherocytes without there being immune activity. So you might get a false positive on that. So moving on to the consensus statement, they've got this um, algor diagnostic algorithm for IMHA. Sorry, that's really blurry. I don't know why. Um, but essentially, once you've detected anemia, you need to diagnose either or detect either two or more signs of immune-mediated destruction of the red cells. And if you've got that, then you need to detect one or more signs of hemolysis. So I'm going to go through what those signs of immune-mediated destruction are and what the signs of hemolysis are and what to look out for them to be able to get the slam dunk diagnosis. And then in the situation, Jeff, that we were talking about, if you don't have a positive saline agglutination, you don't have a positive Coombs, you've potentially only got spherocytes. You have to go down the pathway of having at least one sign of immune mediated destruction. So either the only the spherocytes have to go down the pathway of looking for hemolysis and treating with suspicion that you might be wrong or um, looking for other causes of the anemia. So potentially doing bone marrow aspirates and things. So we'll go back to looking for signs of immune mediated destruction. Oops. The first thing we're gonna look for are spherocytes. Um, cats don't have, you can't look for spherocytes in cats because they don't have the central color. Does everyone look at smears? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I try to. Excellent. Um, so essentially, we've got a fairly normal looking red blood cell here. And you can see his next door neighbor here is much smaller than he is and doesn't have the central pallor in the middle. And that's consistent with a spherocyte. They're actually, particularly with a fresh smear, when you don't have any of that kind of crenation or artifact from. Um, delayed processing, actually really easy to pick. And I would encourage everybody to do that 
if they're running in-house blood tests because it just adds to your evidence and how sure you are of your diagnosis straight away. Um, stored blood products have very high proportions of stericides. So do that before, or at least collect a CBC and send it out to a reference lab for a pathologist near you before you do your transfusion. So presence of stericides is one, cri one criteria for immune-mediated destruction. The second is a positive saline agglutination test. Oh, that's good spelling, sorry. Um, <laughs> so we wanna do one drop of blood with four drops of saline. They've done sensitivity specificity testing with the different ratios. I always used to do one-to-one, -one, but one drop of blood, four drops of saline has better sensitivity than one-to-one. Um, if you look down the right, so you want to look at the slide like this, and this is what we call macroscopic agglutination. So you can see chunks in there. If you can't see those chunks, you should always look under a microscope and look for clumps of red cells that might be microscopic, even in a kind of pretty smooth looking sample macroscopically. These three things, RULO, high total protein and high fibrinogen can um, give you an artificial positive in your agglutination. And in, the, in those situations, if, that, if you're seeing those, you should wash the erythrocytes. Does anyone know how to do that? Uh, Actually really no. So you wanna just do a, a soft spin on the, uh, in your centrifuge of your blood. So EDTA blood, and then you're going to pour off the supernatant, the plasma on the top, and then you're going to add saline in. You're going to resuspend. You're going to put it in your centrifuge again, and you're going to do that three times. And you spin it, and then you're going to pour the top off, and then you're going to add saline again, resuspend, spin it, pour the top off. So essentially what you're doing is just washing any high protein levels or high fibrinogen levels off the surface of the cells. And if you've still got agglutination after that, it's true antibody mediated agglutination. Does that make sense? So this is what agglutination looks like. This is an agglutinate. This is RULO. So cats have this all the time. And if you look at this, that looks like exactly the same as that, doesn't it? But if you're seeing that with this, you need to wash your erythrocytes before you overinterpret it. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So we didn't get a positive on our spherocytes. We didn't get a positive on our saline say agglutination test. We're going to send off a Coombs test to determine whether there's autoantibodies or um, anti erythrocyte antibodies in circulation. So if you've got agglutination, it might actually interfere with your results for your Coombs test, which is why a lot of the time we get false negatives. So that gives us a fairly low sensitivity. So we get false negatives in 61 to 82%. But the specificity is higher. So if you've got a positive, you're much less likely to get a false positive than a false negative. So specificity is 94 to 100%. Can you do this test after initiating immunosuppressants? Because often we see patients that have started on PRED but don't have that kind of slam dunk diagnosis. You can imagine if you've started immunosuppressants and you're trying to detect antibodies, but there's less antibodies, obviously the sensitivity is gonna go down. If you've given a transfusion, your patient is likely to have formed antibodies to the transfused cells even if they don't actually cause hemolysis, you're more likely to get a false positive, but that's a fairly appropriate immune response to transfusion. Do you guys want me to run through how the Coombs works or what we're actually testing? Yes, please. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I thought I, this picture is super simple and it's exactly how it is. Um, so what they, what they've done is developed antibodies. So they've got these antibodies sitting in a little tube in the lab, which are anti-antibodies. So these antibodies are directed at antibodies sitting on the red cell surface. 
So the only thing they'll bind to in circulation is antibodies on the red cell surface. So they've got a little fluorescent marker on them. So when they bind, so when they, they, you put them in with the red cells with the antibodies on their surface and they bind to the red cells and then they're stuck there, right? And then you wash the erythrocytes, same way as we have, but those antibodies don't get washed off. If those antibodies didn't have anything to stick to, so if there were no anti-red cell antibodies on the surface here, those antibodies would just get washed off and you'd get none of the fluorescence left in the, in the solution. But if they do get stuck, it tells you that there are antibodies on the surface of the red cell. Um, and when you shine a light through it and detect the fluorescence, um, it'll show up positive. Does that make sense? I don't think the anti-antibodies is very confusing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What about the indirect? Hmm. That should be a question with notice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I can't remember. And neither can I. That's why I asked. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I did know once. Yeah. I, I think the indirect was, um, I don't know if it's right, but I always thought it was less sensitive because it's looking for the antibodies that are free in the patient's serum. So if all of their anti-red blood cell antibodies are found to red blood cells, then you're not going to pick them up if you're just looking for them that are free in the serum. Oh, that makes sense. So it's essentially the same test, but run on a, or on a plasma or serum sample. So they're yeah. unbound antibodies. Interesting. Yeah, I think so. Okay, cool. Um, Jeff, can your homework be to let us know the answer to that question next? <laughs> you probably you probably earned not to have to do any homework, Josh. You're up. All right. <laughs> I'll write it down. Oh, good. Okay, so we've talked about having the two or more signs of immune mediated destruction. Now we're going to move on to the different signs of hemolysis. So we've got a document, not just that there's hemolysis, but that it's mediated by the immune system, which we've kind of done. But now we need to also show that the red blood cells are breaking down. So it's not, not enough to demonstrate antibodies there, but we have to demonstrate that the red cells are, are rupturing. And the different ways that we can do that are the presence of hyperbilirubinemia, um, hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, or the red cell changes we see on a smear associated with destruction of red blood cells. Okay, so we talked a little bit about intravascular versus extravascular. And obviously, if we've got extravascular hemolysis or, or intravascular, we're going to have a high increased level of bilirubin being produced in circulation. Obviously, if we're just looking at this, we need to rule out the other causes of hyperbilirubinemia, such as obstructive cholestasis, pancreatitis, sepsis, or decreased liver function. And to make a diagnosis of hyperbilirubinemia, you can actually just use any bilirubinuria in cats, two plus on a dipstick in dogs, or icterus or an increased plasma bilirubin. So you don't always have to have an increased plasma bilirubin. You can just do a um, urinalysis and that meets the criteria in this paper. But just to review how hemoglobin is produced or why we end up, not how hemoglobin is produced, but how hemoglobin breaks down and we end up with an increased bilirubin level. Does anyone remember this? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. I've put a really complicated diagram in. Apologize. Um, so essentially, if a red blood cell breaks down in circulation, you get free hemoglobin in circulation. Hemoglobin breaks down and um, the excess stays in the bloodstream and causes hemoglobinemia. The, the rest can either go into a macrophage or into a hepatocyte and be processed into bilirubin. 
once you've got so much red blood cell breakdown that you've saturated the capacity of the macrophage and the hepatocyte to produce bilirubin, then the excess is going to shift in this direction and we're going to end up with more hemoglobin, more hemoglobinemia and then it's going to become clinical. Hemoglobin in circulation has to be excreted by the kidney and can be quite damaging. It's nephrotoxic. So these patients, we need to monitor renal um, enzymes. Now you can imagine if a red blood cell is breaking down in, in the, well, you can imagine an extravascular hemolysis where the red cell is taken up by the macrophage. The macrophage is doing a lot of the bilirubin unconjugation and then it still has to be processed by the hepatocyte. Um, so we're going to get more capacity for bilirubin process uh, for bilirubin production if we've got extravascular hemolysis than if we've got intravascular hemolysis, just because the, the red cells are um, inside the macrophage. Okay. So the, the kind of cautions with using hemoglobinemia or hemoglobinuria, so we talked about hyperbilirubinemia, but now we'll talk about hemoglobinuria, uh, hemoglobinemia, um, is that sometimes we get that through artifact. So if we're just looking at a piece of each tube and saying, oh, they're hemoglobinemic, but it was a really traumatic venipuncture. For example, we collected the blood sample through a narrow gauge IV catheter. If the sample storage was too cold, we'll get red cell lysis in after sampling. Um, if the blood is lipemic, it increases red cell fragility and you'll get increased lysis after sampling. And we also, because of the differentials for hemolysis, we want to make sure it's not myoglobin. Why would we see myoglobinemia? What, what might cause hemolysis and... Um, muscle breakdown. Snake bites. Snake bites, good. Any others? Trauma. She probably shouldn't, wouldn't see hemolysis to trauma. Mm. I'm wondering about things like toxoplasma that I'm not, not I mean, I have seen toxo cause CK to go up, but I don't remember them being myoglobinemic. It would be pretty spectacular infection hmm. to end up myoglobinemic. Yeah. It's an emergency condition that I'm thinking of, and it's the middle of summer. Oh, heat stress. Right. Did somebody else say something? I heard heat stress. I said the same thing. Oh, excellent. Good. Um, so obviously in patients that presents collapsed anemic with hemoglobinemia, Make sure you run a CK um, looking for either snake bite or heat stress. Um, say you've got red urine. The best way, I sort of wish I hadn't put all this writing on the side because I want to quiz you guys, but um, if you've got red urine, the best way to differentiate between hemoglo uh, hemoglobinuria or hematuria is to spin down the sample. And if it's red cells, they'll spin to the bottom. If it's hemoglobin in suspension, they'll stay in the suspension. Um, if you get a heme reaction on a dipstick with no red cells, it's probably true hemoglobinuria and you probably, that's, that's adequate for meeting the criteria for um, evidence of hemolysis. Um, if you've got poorly concentrated or alkaline urine, with hematuria, so particularly if you've got, for example, um, uh, urea is producing um, U UTI, causing alkaline urine, it, and there's hematuria in there, you'll get red cell lysis. Now, obviously, those dogs aren't going to be anemic, you'd hope, but um, you just want to rule out an infection at the same time. I've heard the idea of putting a pinpoint light source through the urine because a colloid, i.e. the hem the hematuria will reflect the light and you can see the see it, whereas a hemoglobinuria, which is a solution, won't. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I haven't heard that. I don't know how accurate it is, but... 
it'd be an easy thing to do if you had a pinpoint light source and then then you, then you can go with the more exotic one that, to confirm it yeah um so we talked about intravascular versus extravascular hemolysis so this is a picture of hemoglobinemia and this is a very bad picture of hyperbilirubinemia um but that that serum does look a little bit pink tinged but we typically see hemoglobinemia with intravascular hemolysis and hyperbilirubinemia with severe extravascular or intravascular hemolysis So looking at the red cell morphology changes that we might be able to see in-house to show evidence of red cell lysis or hemolysis, erythrocyte ghosts are big ones. So you can see they're very clearly ghosts, very descriptive um, term. And you can see also in this sample, there's some spherocytes and some unhappy looking red cells that look like they're losing their volume. So moving on, we've sort of, I guess, made our diagnosis based on evidence of hemolysis. So do actually, before we move on to what the recommended tests are for IMHA, I do want to just cover the other causes of hemolysis quickly and get you guys to throw out um, what the differentials might be if it wasn't immune-mediated hemolysis. What are the other causes? Thanks, Mike. Great. You're done in okay. okay, sorry. No, you go, you go. One each. You, sorry, go. I <laughs> you go. I was just gonna say other like um envenomations to a lesser extent, like we had one at Ned that was a bee stick. Great. Excellent. So that's envenomation. I put I've got my little categories in my head, envenomation, snake, spider, or bee. Yeah. Or cause hemolysis. Anything else? You've said you said infectious already, so that's like mycoplasma. But I guess with also toxicities, you've got like your Heinz body. Um yeah. the things like onion ingestion. Excellent. Yeah. So I'd call it oxidant damage as a differential there. Other toxicities um, like um, zinc. Skink. Zinc? Like metal toxicity? Oh, zinc. Oh, zinc. I think it's skink. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is going to be crazy. Because <laughs> yeah. actually skunk musk is a cause of hemolysis. And I was like, is she whoa. confused? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm on my hand free. So I don't know if you guys can hear me very well in the car, hopefully. That's fine. Thanks, Helen. Um, like that dog that had the um, maybe incidental, maybe not uh, foreign metal foreign body. Yes, absolutely. So that falls under the category of oxidant damage as well. So um, we've got onions and, and ingested plants that cause it, oxidant damage. We've got heavy metals, zinc being yeah. one. Can you give me another one? Uh, Hypophosphatemia. Right. Yeah. Garlic, or does that class as, does that cause that, like onions do? It can. Yes, it can. Yeah. Got to eat huge amounts of it. Um, what about um, on the vein of like of low phos phosphate, hypophosphatemia? Say I gave a patient um, D5W instead of maintenance fluid. What would happen to its red cells? Or well, the fluid or the water is going into the cell. Yeah. 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 And then what happens to the cell? And hemolysis. Yeah. Good. Excellent. So hypotonic fluid administration will cause hemolysis. What about um, dog with a non bleeding hemangiosarcoma? Like a Injury, like red cell fragmentation. Excellent. Yeah, so mm -hmm. microangiopathies. And what morphology changes in the red cells might we see with microangiopathies? Schistocytes, like red blood cells or just there. Excellent. 
And where would we expect our platelet count to be in dogs with microangiopathies? <clears throat> Is it likely uh, high or low? Good. Reduced. Yeah, reduced. Good. Excellent. So does everybody understand why I think that's important? Or why it might help you differentiate? Is it reduced because of increased consumption because of the plate with blood stasis and it just stick together? Absolutely. So mm. these microangiopathies are essentially damaged to the red cell which is not damage to the red cell, sorry. It is damage to the red cell, but it's damaged by the vessels being damaged. The endothelium is damaged. And then we get activation of clotting locally. And what it actually is, is strands of fibrin spanning across a narrow capillary vessel. And the red cell tries to get through and that vessel is only the width of the red cell and the red cell fractures in half as the fibrin blocks its path. But that will also trigger clotting because we've got endothelial damage, which triggers clotting, which we know all about, obviously, now. The endothelial damage will activate platelets and it will also um, stick to the fibrin strand that's there. So we get activation of clotting as well as, which is actually the trigger for the fragmentation of the red cells. So you shouldn't really get red cell damage without consumption of platelets in those diseases. This, they're diseases that the D-dimer is usually sky high and the dogs are actually quite well and it's always quite remarkable. Um, and the two main ones are hemangiosarcoma that we see and DIC is the other one, but obviously those dogs are unwell. Um, so I put that under the category of fragmentation. Um, there's another big one that I'd like to talk about, which is very rare but something to consider. We've had a patient recently, Josh, that we talked about it with. Is this the hemolytic uremic syndrome one? Oh, no, it wasn't actually, but that's an interest. That, that is a microangiopathy. Okay. Um, so that's something that is only really reported in greyhounds, which is where clots form in their renal blood vessels and they get this, um, like the fibrin strands spanning across the vessels and they get breakdown of the red cells. So they get this hemolytic uremic syndrome mm. because it happens lo in localised to the kidneys and they get uremic as well. Um, so we have... Um, B pattern? Sorry, no. I was just trying to guess the one that you were talking about. We we have, the hysteria uh, sarcoma case we had recently, the hemolytic one. That's another one on my differential list. It's not the one I was talking about, but yes. So hysteria sarcoma, tell us more. How would that cause hemolysis that isn't immune mediated? I think there's a dendritic cell and dendritic cell chewing off the red cell. Uh, what what type of tumor of the? Just a histiocytic sarcoma. Yeah. So how does that cause hemolysis? Hmm. I think it's histios histio erythrocytosis. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Phagocytosis, yeah. So it's not that there's antibodies against the red blood cells, it's that the histiocytes, which happen to be malignant and happen to be in the spleen, which is filtering the red blood cells, are deranged and they're just chomping away randomly at red blood cells because they don't have, they've lost their kind of orderly function. Um, so we get increased hemolysis with this hemophagocytic syndrome or form of histiocytic sarcoma. Um, the one that I was getting at, Josh, so say we had a nine-year-old Springer Spaniel who presented uh, with acute onset hemolysis after exertion. It's the phosphofructokinase deficiency. Yes. And other, like wow. pyruvate deficiency. Yes. Excellent. So hereditary causes of hemolysis. So hereditary red blood cell defects, um, which alter the metabolism of the red blood cells so that they can't get enough they can't produce enough glucose or can't process glucose and then they hemolyze. So that covers most of our non-immune -hemo non hemolytic anemia causes. And the only other one is, is drugs, but I don't really have any great examples of what would cause hemolysis. Oh, I do. Methylene blue. 
is known to cause hemolysis. So moving on really quickly to the testing that's recommended based on the ACVIM consensus statement. Um, CBC and Biochem with particular smear review by pathologists because we're looking for erythrocyte ghosts as enough evidence to make our diagnosis. Um, and also spherocytosis. Saline autoagglutination, a mycoplasma PCR if it's a cat because cats very rarely get primary IMHA. They almost always have secondary IMHA. A Coombs test, but I'll only send that off if we haven't met the criteria for diagnosis with the saline autoagglutination. A urinalysis in-house is fine, but if there's active sediment, I would recommend doing a culture and sensitivity because obviously missing an infection that is triggering, particularly IMT. I know one specialist who, if there's an, a urinary tract infection at diagnosis of IMT, will treat the urinary tract infection without immunosuppressants, which I think is very brave. Um, and often the IMT goes away with clearance of the UTI. Um, I'm not that brave. I use prednisolone. Um, chest radiographs for evidence of pneumonia or cancers. Um, obviously, the age of the patient will make you more suspicious either way. Um, and an abdominal ultrasound, I've put stars here because an abdominal ultrasound in a patient with either IMHA or IMT is probably going to be abnormal. And it can be quite confusing to, to interpret that. So often with anemia, we get extramedullary hematopoiesis in the spleen and therefore we get splenic nodules. And where we're looking for evidence of a hemangiosarcoma or other neoplasia that might be triggering IMHA, it can be quite distressing for owners to have to, I guess, make the um, decision about whether to continue when there's these questionable splenic changes that you can't really sample at, the, at this point because of the risk of bleeding and the fragile kind of state of the patient. And particularly with IMT, I tend to wait a couple of weeks before I do the ultrasound, if I do the ultrasound at all, because the ultrasound probes quite, can cause bruising. Um, so it's just something that, given that there's very few cancers that actually trigger IMHA, I'm not sure about the value of ultrasound, a full abdominal ultrasound in these unstable, potentially unstable patients. I put it lower on the priority list. All right, we've got two minutes for treatment, but essentially it's prednisolone. Um, so there's no studies that have demonstrated good effect of any immunosuppressants other than prednisolone on their own. Um, there are lots that we can use in addition to prednisolone, but the main change is that we used to use four mg per kid per day of prednisolone, and they've shown that there's not really any difference in efficacy between two and four mg per kid per day. So we've just dropped that dose recommendation slightly. So dogs under 25 kilos get two to three mix per day divided dose to minimize side effects. And dogs over 25 kilos are so susceptible to the prednisolone side effects that we move to a milligram per meter squared dosing range rather than a mix per kg dosing range with the same efficacy. So sometimes it feels like you know, you're giving 60 milligrams to a 35 kilo dog. It doesn't feel like you're giving enough, but it's actually plenty. Um, the recommendations for introducing a second agent, which is a question I get asked all the time, if it's aggressive disease. So the two prognostic factors for poor outcome are an elevated urea or an elevated total bilirubin. So if they're elevated, the recommendation is to add a second agent so that you'll be able to get immunosuppressive effects faster. The PCV, if the PCV is falling by greater than 5% per 24 hours in the first seven days, they recommend introducing another agent. If the patient remains dependent on blood transfusions beyond seven days after starting PRED, and I probably do five days, and I know Dave does closer to three. So everyone's got their own sort of comfort zone um, with that, but the ACVIM recommendation is seven days after starting PRED. Um, and if they're greater than 25 kilos in body weight, I usually start a second agent and the ACVIM um, recommendations are start a second agent because the risk of PRED side effects is so high um, that they'll be pretty unwell because of the PRED on its own. So which second agent do we choose? 
Um, essentially, azathioprine, and cyclosporine, and mycophenolate, all equally effective based on studies with different downsides. So, for example, azathioprine, um, we're not going to give it to cats. Um, but, and obviously, risk of hepatotoxicity. So, if there's an underlying a hepatopathy of any kind, I'll stay away from azathioprine. Um, theoretically, it takes two weeks to work um, based on kind of what we would taught like it's very sort of anecdotal but actually it works sequentially from when you start um, and it reduces the number of antibodies so it will actually take a while to work and then um, cyclosporin the side effects of nausea uh, obviously sort of if the dog's already vomiting off their food despite being on prednisolone I won't use cyclosporin um, mycophenolate also side effect of nausea and unfortunately can't be given in conjunction with um, uh, anti antacids um, with uh, azimeprazole, which is something we often need to do because we're giving high doses of prednisolone. So I'll just choose one of the three based on the patient essentially. Um, there's absolutely no point in doing a third immunosuppressant. So you should do prednisolone plus one of these three, but there's no point doing a third one. It doesn't make any difference to outcome. With IMT, sometimes we use vincristine. Um, it, it increases the platelet number and they get out of hospital sooner. But the, I, there's a sort of question about whether we discharge patients sooner because their platelet count is high, but whether the platelets are actually, act, actually effective or not. Um, and the other thing that I think is just a little bit makes me nervous about using it is that the most common side effects of vincristine are gastrointestinal. So it often causes vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and these patients with IMT are often bleeding in their gastrointestinal tract and vomiting and diarrhea are traumatic for the gastrointestinal tract and potentially increase risk of bleeding before we get that increased platelet count. So I am wary of it, but it's certainly among the sort of recommended treatment options. And as far as dose reductions go, um, so the, the goal is to keep the PCV stable at greater than 30% for two weeks. And then we can reduce prednisolone by 25% every three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. As long as the PCV stays stable over 30. And obviously you completely change course if they drop at all. Aim for a total treatment course for three to six months for prednisolone. And if you're reducing by 25%, they're going to be on a pretty low dose for the tail end of that. Um, and four to eight months for azathioprine, cyclosporine or mycophenolate is needed. Um, there's a little, there's not a consensus amongst the specialists who wrote the consensus statement on whether you should wean cyclosporine, mycophenolate or azathioprine or whether you can just stop cold turkey. Um, some specialists stopped, some specialists weaned and they just said, do whatever you want, essentially. But just make sure that you don't do it at the same time as stopping prednisolone completely. So stop the prednisolone and then two weeks later, look at stopping the other agents if, if you, everything stayed stable. Um, now, all IMHA patients should be getting one of the following antithrombotic agents because the biggest risk to them survival-wise, because we can manage anemia with transfusions, the biggest risk to them is clots. Um, I've put unfractionated heparin CRIs in. Um, it's not practical in Australia. We just don't have the monitoring assays available at point of care. So um, I wouldn't use these myself, but it is listed injectable um anti 10 a um deltaparin which is fragment um again we've moved away from that because rivaroxaban has a really similar effect but is given orally and only over 24 hours so much cheaper and more sustainable option once we discharge the patients from hospital so these three are all factor inhibitors which means that they work best on venous clots which are really common as a cause of like pulmonary thromboembolism in these patients. Clopidogrel is a platelet inhibitor um, and will inhibit platelet um, participation in both venous clots and arterial clots. So that's usually my first choice, also given every 24 hours. And if I'm really concerned about clots, so a patient's really panting or looks like they might be having some thromboembolic events, 
um, with, with the absence of radiographic changes, I will sometimes do both rigoroxaban and clopidogrel while they're hospitalised or on high doses of prednisolone and then pull one of them at some point along treatment. So you will stop the rivaroxaban when the PCV is stable, like there's no sign of hemolysis? I, I keep them on it until they go off their pred. Mm. Yeah, so I probably overdo it, but the, the actual risks are very low with mm. rivaroxaban and clopidogrel. They're very well tolerated. And unless we've got we've forecast having to do an invasive procedure, like say the it was secondary to a splenic tumor or something like that, um, I'll keep them on it. Mm. Um, and then monitoring, um, we prefer to do CBCs at external labs with this new review by a pathologist, preferably um, until they're stable at greater than thirty percent for two weeks. Um, we're looking for ongoing presence of spherocytes, ongoing presence of regeneration and ongoing presence of agglutination. And that's the sort of purpose of doing this new reviews because these will all be indicative of ongoing immune mediated destruction. So you might have a stable PCV, but if you've still got destruction being balanced by regeneration, it's still autoimmune activity and you shouldn't be dropping your dose. Um, the biochemistry we monitor is the urea and totability rhythm until they're normal, which is normally within the first couple of weeks after um hospitalization obviously if they're on azathioprine we monitor for neutropenia and bone marrow suppression um on a cbc as well as alt for the six weeks after starting azathioprine because of the hepatotoxicity and then we do a cbc before every dose change um which is around about three weeks every three weeks once stable and that's it. Oh, cool. Thank you. Very yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, no Thank you so much, Jana. No worries. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Thanks,